So good morning, everyone, once again. Um, for those of you who were, who were here yesterday, uh, we had a fascinating day with 30 presentations covering a wide variety of topics related to the economics of off-site construction, examination of alternative business models, labor issues, carbon impacts, fire safety, BIM technology, and on and on. Um, it was a great day. This morning, uh, we continue the program with three inspirational speakers, Michael Green of MGA Architecture and Katerra, Jerry McCaughey of Integra, and Dave Walsh of Marriott International. After the keynotes, we have a coffee break, uh, also for networking, followed at 1045 by our breakout sessions. This afternoon at 1 p.m., we will have a panel discussion in the waterfront room. Uh, this will be moderated by Pat Layton. The panel will include Jason Blinker, CEO of Blinker Companies, Jerry McCaughey of Integra, Karim Sayoun of Blueprint Robotics, and a new addition, Andy Hamilton of Steercraft, will be joining us as well. They will discuss a variety of topics related to off-site construction, and then there'll be an opportunity for Q&A. Please stay for this panel discussion. You, you really don't want to miss it. And with that said, let me introduce our first keynote speaker this morning. In the words of, of Ted, Michael Green wants to solve one of architecture's biggest challenges, meeting worldwide housing demand without increasing carbon emissions. Michael founded Michael Green Architecture in 2012 with a focus on advanced wood buildings that support community, health, and the environment. In 2013, he delivered a TED Talk, Why We Should Build Wooden Skyscrapers, which has had over one million views on YouTube, including about 15 views by me. Michael has been honored with North America's most prestigious architectural awards, and we're fortunate to have him with us today. Please join me in giving Michael Green a warm welcome. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit of a story. Um, kind of a transition that we're going through in my firm, and it's, it speaks to sort of where the industry is going in this whole conversation about um, industrialized construction and moving to offsite for the most part. So just for history, I started my firm, my practice in Vancouver, BC. We're about 26 people right now. We're growing. We'll probably end up at about 35 in the next year. Um, and this is us when we first moved in and we bought this slab from Structural Lamb, or Structural Lamb actually gave us the slab that was our desk, and so I like to start the talk there. Um, because we, we really started in this sort of grassroots kind of era of mass timber, and, and really that was only six years ago. And we were, you know, been building for probably 10 now, 12 years in mass timber. And um, obviously things have changed a lot to the point where there's a big room of people that I can barely see out there in the, in the lights. Um, but this year, we went through a big change and a big decision, and that was um, I'd, been, I'd been advising Katerra for the last um, two and a half, three years since really almost they started. Um, some of you will know Katerra. They're a um, Silicon Valley startup company that um, has basically decided to really look at how our industry works, the construction industry works, and really trying to to look at how it can work far better. And so I thought I'd tell you a bit of the detail story about what they're up to, or, or kind of from, at least from the perspective of our relationship with Katerra. But to explain our relationship, um, uh, Katerra bought the economic interests of my company, but we still run it. So we still run as a, as a sort of independent um, group, supporting Katerra where we can, but also working on projects independent of Katerra. So we have this kind of interesting um, relationship, and it comes from the fact that about half of what we do is custom bespoke projects. I like that UK word, bespoke. And about half of what we do is typological projects, meaning highly repeatable projects. And what we find in our firm, and I'm just going to show you a variety of the, the sort of more custom things. Some, some of you will have seen these projects before. Um, but what we do is on the, on the custom projects, and what we've philosophically done for a very long time is always wanted to take the project, figure out, okay, what is it about this project that's going to teach us something about a highly repeatable solution in construction, a highly repeatable solution for a building type or for a structural type 
or for even a social or other architectural sort of type of fixing a problem that we think not just is applied to that building, but for that can be actually system wide. And so that philosophy, I think, permeate, permeates the firm and then ultimately led us to the second half here. I'm just going to fly through a ton of slides so you can get a sense of what I mean by the custom projects. And I'll stop on a few and just mention some highlights. But, and then the second half, I'm going to talk about these, uh, this issue of what a typology is. So how we can tackle um, one type of building and create effectively a mass-produced solution for that type of building while still providing a highly customized design that feels unique to its place, its region, um, and the people using the building. So um, just as I sort of scroll through, what we did over the last six, six really and, and longer years since the firm was young is started to work in all kinds of different mass timbers. So um, that remains a really important part of the practice. Um, although CLT in general has become one of the most important parts of, of what we're doing. So this project is City Hall. It's made out of laminated strand lumber as an example. And it was an early example of, for us of learning about offsite construction. So we were able to build this big um, atrium space and those ceiling panels you see there as these big offsite 12 foot by um, 30 foot panels that um, or built as a sandwich with acoustic material and mechanical systems all integrated, built off-site by structure craft and then dropped onto the building afterwards. This is Ronald McDonald House. It's a CLT project that we did where we sort of developed a system of tilting up um, slabs of CLT and dropping in lightwood cons cassettes for floors. And so in each case, as I say, we were trying to demonstrate what this might do to inform other types of buildings. And this was an example of what we think of as a legacy st style approach to buildings. So buildings like university campus buildings, where they might be stone campuses or brick campuses, we wanted to demonstrate that that substrate ultimately could be CLT and that there's systems for how you do that um, that needed to be developed. And so we used this this project, as you can see, you don't see the CLT right now on the outside. You see a little bit like there in, the, in this living room shot. Um, but, but for the most part, you know, we want to demonstrate again that these buildings are highly unique um, approaches for different types. Sometimes we're focused on how do we make it the most economical solution. How sometimes we, we think about it more as making it the most durable legacy type solution for, for instance, university campuses. Um, that was a rogue shot in there. But, um, and then this is the Wood Innovation Design Center, which some of you may know is the first tall wood building in North America. And it's a CLT building. And again, we were looking at, and this was early days for us, looking at system approaches. Um, so I, I, you know, often I'll spend lots of time describing these. I'm not going to today because I want to get to the, the second half of the talk. So um, system approaches that start looking at, OK, what can be built off site? Obviously, working in wood is a massive um, opportunity to work offsite because of the weight, the strength, the weight allows us to do it. Um, but also, what we're doing now is a lot more integration of systems into the into the wood before it arrives on site. And so, again, this project, the Wood Innovation Design Center, was kind of early days for us to figure out what that might look like um, as a process, and we learned a lot. Um, we also are doing just for, for that. This is a project um, in Utah on top of a mountain. Um, for a music studio and projects on top of Whistler that we were trying to get built, but all in mass timber because, again, in a lot of the times we're working, and this is another typology, mountain architecture is one of our typologies, um, is how do you build quickly, how do you build off-site, and how do you build when you have a very, very short build cycle on the summit of a mountain where, it, like in Whistler on the summit, Whistler, by the way, is one of the biggest ski resorts in North America, if you don't know, it's in Vancouver. And uh, you're at about 8,000 feet right now on top of this mountain. So we get three months to build a project, which means if you don't build offsite, you really are into many years of construction in order to deliver something like this. So building in remote regions or building on top of mountains becomes this really compelling reason we wanted to do mass timber. Now, what you're going to see is when I said at the beginning that about half our work is bespoke, each of these projects is quite unique. And, and yet, each one has got a system behind it. This is, this is on Baffin Island and way in northern Canada. Baffin's next to Greenland. We get one boat a year. It's, a, it's an Inuit language center. And so the best way to build it is off-site, bring the panels, assemble it in this very remote region of the world. This is in northern Sweden. Um, in a town that has lots of access, but it's interesting. We've developed a system. This is a huge arts and sports 
uh, and Leisure Center, very large. There's a public swimming pool. You can see the slide there. Big gymnasiums, art galleries, indoor rock climbing, uh, public library, things like this. This is the public library piece. All built in CLT in this case. And here what we're doing is developing a system for very long span CLT. And so if you can see here in those box sections, the, the roof structure, you're seeing box sections, those are prefabricated, um, we call them caissons, so, so beams effectively made in a box of CLT. And they're tall enough in some cases that I can walk down the inside of these boxes, but they can span more than the length of the room. So for the US, we're spanning 120 feet, and so maybe about 40 meters for, um, for everybody else. And, um, so you know, huge span using CLT, and again, learning and working in a, in a context where, um, believe it or not, even in Scandinavia, CLT is pretty new, um, and demonstrating, OK, if we can build off-site, we can get these amazing spans, amazing sort of integrated systems. So these big box caissons actually have all the mechanical systems all kind of integrated into them, and, and, and uh, they're pretty cool. So um, this project was kind of the game changer. And I'm going to pause here for a moment because, or on these slides for a moment, because the, the, the interesting thing, this is a project called T3, and some of you here probably know this project. It's built in Minneapolis for Heinz, the developer Heinz. And for us, what was interesting, it's, it's developed in a neighborhood that's all these old industrial buildings. And so the character of this building, and as an architect, um, I would describe this building for us as being super quiet. You know, it was kind of a building that just wanted to be a good neighbor. Didn't try to stand out, didn't try to be special. It just, I just wanted this project to just fit into its neighborhood and be a good neighbor. And so for that reason, for some reason in my mind, when we were building this project, I thought this will be a nice, sweet timber project. And it's definitely, for the US, a very big timber project. But I didn't really think it would be special. And I didn't really think it would capture people's imagination. But what happened was, as much as while we were de designing this, we knew we were developing a system. Here you really see the timber. It's a nail laminated timber construction on glue lamb. Um, as much as we knew we were building a system, it's actually such a simple building, we didn't really think that it might turn into what it's turned into, which is now we have literally dozens of these projects. And we're building a typology of office buildings, both with developers as well as with the Katera group of basically being able to roll out a whole lot of these buildings around North America and, and, and further afield, both at this height and even taller. And you'll see in a minute what I mean by taller. Um, so this is a type, has become a typology. And we've been studying this, especially with Silicon Valley. And I'm going to show you some examples of it, where um, really it's captured the imagination of, the, of the, those that are interested in building office buildings. And it's a huge opportunity for wood, but it, it just makes sense. You know, it's about speed. It's about um, you know, obviously a beautiful building, but the, the, the opportunity for speed of erection and cost that relates to speed of erection has become a huge incentive for communities to be looking at these kinds of buildings. And to my surprise, I was in Salt Lake City um, meeting with, with a group there, and even the mayor's office had sent people to Minneapolis to look at that building. And that's what I was starting to find, is that this, this again, this building has kind of captured imagination. And so, you know, it's built, and again, I won't spend a lot of time in the detail, but it's built with systems. So systems for the exterior envelope, systems obviously for the structure itself that were informing us a lot. Um, we have a bunch of projects in France right now, and this huge development right here is all wood in France. Um, on the right is a 20, I think it's 24-story tower that's, um, that's a hotel by Kengo Kuma, the architect from Japan. And we're doing two towers that look like these in the middle of the project that are um, 18 to 20 stories tall, mixed use kind of projects in wood um, with a lot of residential. So you get a sense um, of this. And again, you can't build projects like this without thinking and from a systems point of view of how, how it's developed and, and how offsite. What's interesting for us is because we work in so many different regions of the world, we're finding that we're learning lessons from different parts of the world in the capacity of different construction marketplaces. And so in Europe, there's a number of companies doing really sophisticated work on offsite, but they don't always plug into these types of buildings. And so we're learning each, in each place what the appropriate group to work with is. And then um, you're throwing me off with these camera. <laughs> it's OK. I, I keep thinking you're like coming up here to take me off stage at some point. <laughs> like, 
you're, you're boring us. Get us off. Get this guy off stage. Um, anyway, cheers. cheers. Hi. Um, so, um, so anyway, the, uh, it, it's, it's good fun because what we're realizing is that although in certain there's a sense of this country or that country is ahead of the game, you guys are doing it more than, than what we are. You have more sophisticated offsite kind of uh, companies. The truth, I would say, is that everybody that we meet around the world is roughly in the same place. There are some companies that certainly are more sophisticated, but everybody is chasing this ideal, and there's, it's still early days. But the enthusiasm for, for it, and, and, and specifically to, to mass timber, is amazing and, and consistent in all these countries we're working in around the world. That's a project in Vancouver we're hoping to do that's residential. And then this project is here in, in uh, the States. It's in Newark, New Jersey. And it's, it's an important one for us because it's an office building. And it's a big, it's about a half million square foot office building. So it's a big office building. It's 12 stories tall. Um, so there you get a sense of the scale. And again, once we're at this scale, huge incentive for us to create a kit of parts approach in order to make this really economical. So it sits on top of a parking garage, and it, you can see it goes up to 173 feet. And it's working with the uh, upcoming, um, uh, hopefully, the upcoming changes to the US building code that'll come in 2021. And what we found in the states is that in specific parts of the states, there's such enthusiasm from a regulatory point of view that the code change that's coming um, to the IBC is, is um, encouraging enough that lots of regions are giving us an opportunity to work to the future code rather than to the existing code. And that's something that I've never seen in my career before, that kind of enthusiasm. We certainly have had it in British Columbia. That's been the attitude um, there for a long time. But it's something that I'm seeing now in the States, which is incredibly encouraging. Um, there are a ton of, and I won't spend time on it, but if you guys want to ask questions outside of this forum, um, I can walk you through all the implications of what this means to build at this scale in the States. But um, we've got a lot of code information that we can talk about. But what's important is that we can. And up to 12 stories is pretty straightforward. 12 to 20, although that may be allowed, means covering the wood. And I, I don't actually think that's going to be um, as realistic as, as um, we might like. I think it's hard. My clients are not interested in covering the wood. The whole point is to see it. So these wood systems, and again, I won't spend time with them, um, have meant not only developing a structural system, but now we're doing a lot of envelope systems. So this was a project we're doing with Katera, and this is the first project I'm going to show with Katera, um, who are building um, what should be the largest CLT factory in the world in Spokane, Washington, certainly the largest in North America, um, European spec kind of factory, um, using both Canadian and US wood, and, um, and should be open with the factory this spring. So it's a very interesting moment for us we will source, um, pro for our projects, we'll be sourcing from lots of different suppliers, Katera just being one. But just having another player in the game is a really positive thing here in North America. Um, and a big, a big player, obviously, at that with their, the scale of their plant. So with Katera, what, this is an office building and, um, and university building in Spokane, Washington, which is where their new plant is. Um, pretty simple classroom type building and as well as offices. We've been developing some pretty simple systems, a lot of exposed mechanical and so forth. So what we can, we're integrating, um, we're integrating offsite mechanical electrical, which is the Katera practice in general to do, um, into CLT system panels that are um, um, uh, 60 feet by, um, by 30 foot kind of base scale, but 60 by 10, um, 10 foot for shipping scale. And um, so big, long panel kind of solutions. Um, the project is all passive house design. And that meant that we had to really think about, and this is the trend in my firm now, is that we're pushing every project we can towards passive house, so super, super low energy kind of performance buildings that kind of, again, picks up where Austria has taught us so much and Germany has taught us so much as far as uh, mass timber, we're learning the same as far as energy performance. So to do a really high performance building, it means developing exterior cladding systems that um, are high performance as well. And, and we've taken that to offsite. So the design of this building has these panels that are two stories tall, um, prefabricated offsite with uh, all of the membranes, insulation layers, and so forth. They clip together with gaskets effectively, so it allows us to place 
the exterior cladding really we can do two floors in a day for this entire building or um, at a time so we'll just do two lifts basically and we'll be able to ideally clad this in about a week and a half two weeks um, with the off-site construction and we developed this system with the windows and here you can kind of see the scale of those windows they're pretty big um, using CLT as our sort of backbone um, and the robustness of the CLT means that we can actually move these panels and not torque them as we lift them from offsite and from a horizontal position into a vertical position and break all our windows, right? That's the risk with offsite um, prefabricated uh, envelope systems. And so we've been able to engineer this such that we can actually do exactly what we've always hoped to do, which is a high performance envelope that's quite expensive to do on site. Doing in the factory is actually quite straightforward and then we can still get them on site without any problems at all. Um, we're also doing a bunch of these projects. These are in British Columbia. These are six story projects where we're starting to look, the, the West Coast building codes are changing a lot, or the Canadian building codes changed a lot to increase the seismic performance of buildings. And we're seeing a huge shift from six story light wood frame buildings that these were originally, this was originally designed in. So that we've developed kind of this sweet typology around light wood frame. Light wood frame at six stories in Vancouver and in, in, the, in the West Coast where it's high earthquake, and this is in Victoria, British Columbia, um, is getting really hard to do because it's, it's, um, it, it just, it's, it's almost impossible to meet the, the seismic specs. And so we've shifted now to doing hybrid CLT slabs with light wood frame walls and, and CLT for our shear walls in order to kind of meet this new, much, much higher performer, performance seismic spec. And so it's interesting, we're seeing for the first time, for a long time, I used to think if it's six stories, build it offsite with, with um, as Katera does with light wood frame um, panelized systems. Now we're seeing mass timber start to creep down to lower heights and be economical um, be, simply because the code change around seismic has increased so much. So these are, these, this project is a different one also in Victoria, but very similar um, and has the same story. It doesn't, it's six stories tall and won't, won't be able to be light wood frame like it used to be. So, you know, we're seeing this kind of change in the market that's happening pretty quickly. So um, that's my kind of quick slideshow piece. And um, I realize my timer is no good anymore because I started this before we started. Um, so somebody yank me when I'm getting close to my time, but I want to talk really quickly about typologies. So as I said, these custom projects became the template for how we do typological projects. Katera is working with developers right now to do uh, products specific, uh, specific to those developers. So there's um, currently a big model with Katera of stick built, three story walk up, what are called garden style apartments. And they've done that as a big focus on how do we drive design to simplify things, create this high level of repetition in order to dramatically reduce the cost. And it's about the quantity of types. So if you have a series of wall types, and in fact with the first developer that uh, the Wolf uh, group that Katera started working with, the initial designs had literally hundreds of different types of walls that would go into a typical building. And what Katera on the design team side has been able to do is take that number of different parts down to you know, 30 different wall types instead of 200 different wall types. And constantly looking to reduce those number of types means of course that you're able to dramatically simplify the construction process and create sort of regularity around things that is gonna obviously reduce your cost as well and your efficiency. And so part of the solution is not just choosing to build offsite but designing intentionally for the concept of offsite construction. So because we've been doing this for a while on the, on the custom projects, the bespoke projects, we've, been, we've sort of picked for MGA, what are we gonna to contribute to the Katera um, sort of vision of how this works. And so we're gonna be targeting those office buildings now that we have a whole bunch of them. And, um, and we also are gonna be targeting residential projects, um, mountain projects, because we have some series of mountain projects as well as ocean projects. 
and um, backcountry lodges. You're starting to see a theme here. It kind of relates to my personal interests of mountain stuff, um, but um, but it's kind of it's kind of fun. And we'll, the the sort of sky's the limit of typologies. So I think what we'll see is not just companies like Katera tackling all these kinds of things, but specialist companies sort of saying we're going to tackle this particular. Uh, segment of the market for offsite construction, and there's a lot of opportunities. This is just our list. Um, but before I get into Katera, I should explain that we've been working also with, um, um, I always have to be careful how I say this, with some tech companies that I can't speak specifically about other than this one I can talk about, which is Sidewalk Labs. So Sidewalk Labs is, uh, is an Alphabet company, so Alphabet owned Google and YouTube and a bunch of other companies, it's the founders of, of Google. They started a group called Sidewalk Labs. Um, I, can, I can't show you a lot of what we're doing, but they effectively are looking at a big area in Toronto, a brownfield site, where they're going to do a large scale redevelopment and really kind of imagine the city of the future. And so we've been working with them um, as a sort of master timber architect because their goal, their ambition is to build this entire uh, build out, which may involve, you know, all, uh, ultimately 70 towers, a huge number of towers, um, all in wood, which is obviously a massive game changer. But it speaks to the fact that that um, that what we're seeing in the tech sector is not only companies like Katera that are realizing wood should be the backbone of the platform they're using to to move to offsite and highly industrialized thinking. But we're also seeing these big tech companies recognize that the carbon story is something they care enough about that they're willing to invest huge amounts of R&D into this. And it's game changing for the industry. It's game changing for everybody in this room that these companies with a huge amount of money, huge amount of capacity, huge amount of desire are ultimately going to be the companies that I think start to lead our industry, either as developers, potentially new builders entering the market like a Katera, or um, you know, obviously going to be in a critical part of, um, for all of us as clients in the future. And so working with, with Sidewalk, we've been developing systems for them, highly systematized solutions that will be allowed to uh, adapt to different architects using them. But for the most part, they're highly repeatable solutions. Um, in this case, they need images of, of, of what the projects might look like. So these are not necessarily high or highly repeatable, but they're sort of early days sort of images that we, we could talk about. So, you know, I always like to point out, so the scale of development is like this, towers up to 30 stories. These are actually small and a whole bunch of blocks like this. This is just a template block. Um, but I always do, and you guys all, all know this, but I like this statistic because that block right there that we just showed, um, the timber, the, the wood that in that block, the North American forest grows enough wood every 100 minutes to build that block right there which really helps the public understand what we're all talking about. It's that the resource is available. If we're smart about the resource, we can do this. But it's going to take making this kind of project less expensive than any alternative. And, and, and that means in Toronto, it means steel. And so you know, really analyzing the way systems work is the only way we're going to be able to make it ultimately cheaper. We are, by the way, and it's interesting finding. So I was in Toronto yesterday. Um, Toronto's taken off for CLT projects. We did a tour. I spoke last night, but we did a tour during the day, and I saw a whole ton of really sweet three, four, five-story CLT projects that were beautiful. And, you know, in urban infill, so in cities like Boston, you, you know, you'll, you really can see how these kinds of projects are going to take off. And, and it's, it's exciting to see that turn happening in cities that traditionally have never thought about wood like Toronto, um, which is a highly urban building. So I'm going to spend the next couple minutes, and then I'm, I'm probably getting close to my time. Is somebody watching my time? Five. OK. On disruption. So this part um, is really maybe to introduce the sort of way of shape the thinking around disruption in our industry. And Katera, obviously, is being a, a part of the disruption. Um, Sidewalk and Alphabet are going to be just as big and another type of disruption, um, given their interest in scale. and. The tech companies that we're talking to in Silicon Valley are all interested in getting in this game, which is really interesting, right? What, why is tech interested in it? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. One is that there's not you know, a lot of change in our industry. One is that there's huge economic opportunity in our, our industry that I'm not sure 
our industry has really actually understood what that means. And so this is a kind of fun way to think about it. The telecom industry has gone through, as we all know, because we all have phones in our pockets, a ridiculous amount of change in, in the last 100 years. It's about an $800 billion a year business um, globally. The auto industry, just for reference, has gone through its own massive change, right? And, and robotics and, and um, uh, digital fabrication has become a game changer for the automakers such that they can turn profits and do some pretty interesting things. And one of the things I like about this image is that thought that it used to be that every car down that assembly line with a human was putting the same door on, meaning that car, every car down that line had to be the exact same car. But now with robots, they don't care if it's a different car. So it could be a truck, then a car, then a sports car. It doesn't matter. The assembly line, once you move to a completely automated system, has way more flexibility because computers don't have and robots don't have the same limitations that humans have. That reshapes the way you think about the idea of mass customization. It's not so much mass production as much as the opportunity for mass customization. So we can really design unique things and still ask robots to build them um, and still be able to kind of reshape things. So for reference, uh, you know, as I said, telecom's about 800 billion. Um, the auto industry is about 900 billion. So the building industry, of course, this is what we've been doing for about the same period of time that the other industries, industries have been going through such change, right? We've been really building the same way. And, and I love the fact that we've seen this massive revolution really in five, six years that nobody thought was possible in an industry, but we've got a long way to go. And a lot of the time what I hear from people is, oh, the regulatory process is too complicated. You'll never be able to change it. The concrete lobby is too big. You'll never be able to change it. Oh, there's not enough, you know, people aren't willing to invest enough in the kind of change you're talking about. But this is what we spend in our industry every year, 1.2 trillion. In fact, in the United States, we, we all know that um, tech is a huge driver of the US economy, but construction's three times bigger uh, driver of the US economy every year than, than uh, the tech sector. So in tech, as the tech guys would tell me, and the Michael Marks, who's our CEO at Katera, who used to run Tesla, by the way, um, would tell me is that if he sits in a room in, um, in Palo Alto and has dinner, at every table in that room, there's probably a conversation about some amazing, innovative new change in the industry that's coming that we're all going to experience in about three years. He said he goes to these conferences with, in the construction industry, and there's probably nobody in that room talking about a major you know, change, new company, new way of thinking or reframing it. So for the tech guys, they look at our industry as this vacuum, this vacuum of opportunity, ready for disruption, ready for a complete rethink, because it's such a broken system. We're doing things the way we've done for so long that we haven't actually graduated to realize that the economic opportunity, not just all of the things, other things I care about, like actually housing the world and actually solving climate and other issues, but really just the raw economic opportunity makes this a huge low-hanging fruit for companies with the money to make the change happen. And you know, as much as Ford and the big uh, motor car companies could, could really advance kind of technological changes in their industry because they were big companies, and our industry is filled with small kind of mom and pop shop scale companies, so we don't see that kind of change. Now what we're seeing is the alphabets of the world or the Kateras of the world are, are raising huge amount of money. I think Kateras raised three billion in the last three years um, to completely rethink the way we build. And in every case, the platform of the way they're thinking, every case that I know of at scale with these tech companies is obviously build off site, obviously completely change the process of both design and what you're thinking about when you design and designing for the end construction process, not sort of two different things as we do right now. Right now, the designers sit in one room, the contractors sit in another. This gap means we're inefficient. Put it all together into one place. Compress the time. Use software, use algorithms, use artificial intelligence to dramatically compress that process, to increase efficiency, to understand costs. Um, to solve all these technical problems that we have in our industry. And the money is there for it. And so I'm probably like one minute, two, one, two. two. 
Um, so McKinstry put out this report last year, and I think it's really useful for us to all see, and it's basically what their suggestions were about the changes in our industry. And I'm just gonna scroll through them, but rethink design and engineering, improve procurement and supply chain management, infuse digital technology and materials, improve on-site execution, um, rewire the contractual framework, reskill the workforce, and reshape regulations and transparency. It's a great report. It's also the foundation of why Katera started what Katera started. All of these things are things that need dramatic levels of change. And fundamentally, you know, it's, it's interesting. The industry is slow. Um, and what we do, it's stagnant. We really haven't seen kind of revolution in the industry for at least 40 years, and it's expensive. Two point, in the U.S., 2.3% increase in construction every year, and as we're seeing right now, huge sparks of, of, um, of or huge like, uh, escalation in certain markets. Um, so just to kind of speak really quickly on my last minute on speed, I just want to point out that the, this is a good example, right? The, the Pentagon, if you don't know, is still to this day the largest office building in the world. It's six and a half million square feet, and it was built start to finish in 14 months. The Empire State Building, 102 stories tall, was built in six months from the beginning of construction to top out, six months. Uh, this is built in the Depression, just after the Depression, right? Um, and from uh, and complete the turnkey um, opening in 13 months. Um, by the way, we did an exercise you probably know about to show, or you may know about to show that you could have built it entirely in wood. But today, just so you know, a U.S. statistic is the average multifamily project takes 29 months to build. You want to ask if people outside our industry really want to sort of look at us and say, what are you guys improving? This is an embarrassment, and it's, it's all of our fault. It's certainly regulatory process fault, but the only way it changes is by all of us embracing massive change. So our process really looks at the old process, which basically has a few people like me designing in the front end, and then eventually a ton of people working on site at the tail end of the process, and flips it upside down, right? This, this group of people working at the tail end, our thinking is the opposite. So we bring together everybody that, um, to understand the systems thinking approach to, to building. We've got a, Katera is a vertically integrated company, meaning we'll design everything from light fixtures to faucets to CLT panels to, to integrated panels to complete building systems. But it also is um, driven by the same kind of manufacturing design thinking that other industries, basically every other major industry is currently thinking about. And so we inverse the process so that by the time we're on site, it involves far less people and much more efficiency. And so whereas the normal design process is everybody feeding into a BIM model, our design process kind of does the opposite. It's feeding into a concept around manufacturing, which I know in the room, there's a lot of people that think this way. And what it's doing for us, just diagrammatically, is this level of change, whereas the design process used to be this long, we're able to collapse it dramatically into a much shorter amount of time. And part of that is algorithm, learning new and developing new software tools that take a lot of what we do that's incredibly inefficient in our industry on the design side and let the computer do the work that humans don't need to do. We're doing the same thing, and I'm just going to jump ahead here. We're doing the same thing when it comes to regulatory thinking. So I'm going to jump ahead because I, I know I'm at the tail end here, and I'm just going to talk about this concept, one-third, one-third, one-third. And... Um, the, the, in places like Vancouver, where I live, or San Francisco, or expensive markets, I don't know what Boston's at right now, but I'm sure it's expensive here too. This is an interesting statistic, and this is San Francisco. One third of the cost is land for a project, one third is construction, and one third is city regulatory process and taxation. So everything I've just talked about, the change that's coming and needs to come to our industry, we think in the Katera model, we're going to drop 30% on the cost of construction simply by retooling the process and by vertically integrating and taking a few other steps. But at the end of the day, that 30% is only tackling 30% on one third of the total cost of a project. In a time where we need to change the entire model of affordability, we can't stop just with construction. We actually have to retool the regulatory process and the way cities work. So for those, if there are those here in government, Preparing for that change is critical to deliver on affordability, especially in, in expensive markets. And so I'm hoping that we'll be introducing 
um, in the next year or two, software um, that actually helps cities evaluate, do code reviews, do zoning reviews, and take all of this big data that's available and already in the ethernet and harnesses it to create algorithms that solve the speed processes that currently are choking the system and turning you know, the Empire State Building in 13 months, probably today would take five years to build. And it makes no sense. Um, and the only way we change that is by starting over, clearing the decks, bringing in people from outside our industry and asking really big questions is, is my business model, is each of your business models fitting into the future or fitting into the past? And I think because you're here, we already know the answer, you're ready for the future. And that's what I'll end on, thank you.